Hey everybody, it's Friday, July 28th, 2017, and you're here, and I'm here, and it's time for another episode of Brain Scratch. Let me first apologize for the tardiness of today's episode. Um, Believe it or not, this is an episode I have actually shot before. I had to completely reshoot this episode thanks to a very bad audio problem. Um, I could have tried to patch it up, but I didn't want to do that to you guys. I wanted to make sure that everything was working right. So I had to refilm the entire thing from the start. Here we are. Let's do it all again. Um, This is a very interesting case, and we're going to do things a little bit different with this case because I need your help. So what we're going to do is this week, I'm going to cover the case. I'm going to talk about the media that is out there that I've been able to dig up on it. Um, Then I want you guys to put your brains to it. Of course, I'm also going to talk about theories. Uh, I want you guys to do the same in the comments section below because next week we are going to be interviewing a family member of the person that was tragically murdered on this case. So um, you guys are going to help get the questions together. You're going to help with theories, different angles, maybe that this person hasn't thought of, maybe different avenues for them to look down. Um, I really just want to see if we can kind of, as a community, um, rally together and really help this woman come to understand what happened to her family member. So uh, hopefully you guys are up for that. Um, Let's go ahead and get started on today's case. And it does take place in Baltimore County. We can see we're at the Baltimore County website, baltimorecountymd.gov. And they have a page specifically on this case, Joanne Jody Elizabeth Lacornu, 1996 homicide victim. On March 2nd, 1996, 23-year-old Jody Lacornu was shot in the back, yes, shot in the back, while seated in her car in the Drumcastle Shopping Center in the 6300 block of York Road, 21212. After being shot, she drove across York Road to another shopping center parking lot where she died. Um, And one of the things that I want to ask this family member is I've heard a few different accounts in terms of was she shot first and then she tried driving off or did she try driving off and then she was shot? Uh, What's interesting about this is the shot actually came in through the, the back seat window and then through her seat and then into her. So um, the theory that perhaps she had been driving off when the gunfire happened uh, does potentially hold some merit, but I've seen it reported time and time again that she was shot and then she drove off. Um, I'm not sure which to believe at this point. Witnesses reported seeing a man reach into Ms. LaCornu's car, remove an unknown item, then drive south on York Road in a white BMW. They described the man as black with a stocky build and wearing a camouflage jacket. Uh, That's another thing where I've seen some minor inconsistencies. Some places report it as green fatigue type jacket. Uh, Here they're saying camouflage. I'm not positive if it's an actual camouflage print. Uh, reward offered. Of course, I will have all this information in the description box below. If you have any information to send into the authorities um, to hopefully help with this case. I mean, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to keep exposure raised to this and see if we can come to uh, help bring justice. It's been over 21 years. And unfortunately, this person is still walking the streets. So Towson, Maryland, or Maryland, sorry. Um, Towson is an unincorporated community uh, in Baltimore County, Maryland. The population was 55,197 at the 2010 census. And there's an interesting aspect to this story. Here we're looking at a map of the parking lots. And this is now known as the Drumcastle Government Center. Um, I don't know if it was the government center uh, 21 years ago when this happened, but this is the Drumcastle uh, shopping center parking lot. This is supposedly where Jody was sitting. And right across the street 
is the parking lot for a shopping center called Giant. And this is the parking lot that she wound up in um, before she unfortunately passed away. So I have a few questions for the family member. I don't know if, did, did Jody go through the intersection? Did she actually drive through the intersection into this other parking lot? Uh, did she jump the curb and run into this other parking lot? Um, I'm really not certain, but there are some very troubling details about uh, how this all went down in terms of he shot her, she goes across into the other parking lot, he follows her. Uh, gets out and then takes something out of her car. So very big mystery in terms of what is that item that was removed from her car. Uh, another very interesting thing about this road is, believe it or not, it also kind of acts as a border between, uh, I believe it's Baltimore City that is on the right side, if the way we're looking at it right now. And on the left, we get into that unincorporated area, which is policed by Baltimore County Police Department. Now, where that becomes an issue is that Baltimore City has actually reached out to the family and said, hey, we'd love to help and we think we have resources where we can help here. The county police department says, no, 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 we don't want your help, which I'm sure is very, very troubling for the family, uh, particularly now that you're looking back at this 21 years later and this case has still not been solved. So who's this family member that I keep talking about? Let's take a look at WBALTV.com and a report by David Collins. Uh, who killed Jody? The 1996 unsolved slaying of Towson University student Jody LaCornu still haunts her family and police. LaCornu's sister, Jenny Carreri, is tra traveling a difficult path in search of truth and justice. Yes, it is her sister that reached out to me. It's her sister that's been working so hard to try to find answers in this case. But not only that, here is a photo. It is actually her identical twin sister that is trying to bring justice into this case. Um, and I believe it was Crime Watch Daily um, that stated it best here. Uh, every time she looks in the mirror, Jenny Carreri is haunted by her loss. For 20 years, she mourned the death of her twin sister, a pretty vivacious 23-year-old, Jody LaCornu. So let me give you just a little more backstory on Jody. Um, Jody was 23. She was attending classes at Towson, um, but she also worked at a bank. She had a boyfriend, a live-in boyfriend. They had been together since she was 18. And unfortunately, on this day, they were having a fight. Now, I've seen in some places where it alludes to they may have been breaking up. Other places just report it as they were just having an argument. But essentially, he told her, don't come home. Don't come home tonight. So um, she decided after work that she would go to a local bar she went to the bar, stayed there until closing time. Uh, apparently, she was kind of friendly with the bar manager, and someone asked her if she would drive an employee of the bar's home. Uh, apparently, this employee had some reason why he couldn't drive, possibly a handicap of some kind. She did drive him home. Uh, then she went and bought a six-pack of beer. And uh, I've seen one report that she might have also stopped at an ATM. I'm not really certain if that happened or not, because I've only seen it in one place. And it's kind of more of a blog than an actual uh, news article. But it, in any regard, she gets to that parking lot. And that is where the tragedy happens. Now, some questions I have for her sister, Jenny. Um, first of all, did she, was she drinking? Was it her intent to actually sit in that parking lot and just drink beer? Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to know if they found any open containers actually in the vehicle. I've also seen it reported that potentially her purse might've been stolen, but once again, it was in one of those articles that I really don't know if I can trust that fact too much. So I'm certainly going to ask Jenny about that. One of the theories in this case is that this is potentially a robbery gone wrong. Uh, I would assume, especially since he reached in and took something out of the car, uh, if this was a robbery, it probably would have been her purse, but I'll be, uh, I'm, I'm anxious to see and get some clarification about that because if her purse was actually left in the car, the next question is, was there money in it? Were her credit cards in it? If that stuff was all left in the car, that theory doesn't hold up very well for me. Uh, what other theories do we have in this case? 
potentially a drug deal gone wrong. Now, Jody certainly has um, struggled particularly with cocaine in her younger days. Uh, I believe she did a treatment program and came out of that. Um, what I'm wondering about here is the stresses she's going through in terms of her relationship, her already being out at a bar, I'm assuming she was drinking at the bar, then going and getting more beer. Was she in a, at a point where um, maybe things weren't looking really good and she was thinking, hey, can I score? Can I call someone and you know try to get some Coke or, or maybe even another drug of some kind? I'm not sure. Uh, and she did make several phone calls from her cell phone while she was in the car. And we're going to get into some of the details there uh, about a potential drug connection. However, it's really important to note that when they tested her body, they did find alcohol in her system. No surprise there. We know she was drinking. She was at a bar all night. Um, but they did not find any narcotics in her system. So if this was a drug deal gone bad, uh, it was the initial contact probably of the drug dealer and her, uh, at least for, for that night. Um, I think I've heard some people speculate maybe she owed someone money or something along those lines. Uh, it's very hard to tell because there is so little information that is out there except for what Jenny's putting out there. And uh, Jenny's views are, you know, one version of the story for sure. But one of the things I love to do on this show are look at multiple points of view and then see where these stories start crossing together. Unfortunately, I cannot find a whole lot of commentary from investigators on this case. Uh, we're going to see later that law enforcement actually has some reasons why they're not able to publicly comment on this case as well. Um, but this case for me is really missing an element of an investigative reporter to help with this. Um, I think Crime Watch Daily did a fantastic job in terms of trying to assist on this case because they actually dug in a little bit. They found some old contacts. Uh, they take Jenny along to meet with some of these people. That from what I'm seeing in terms of the media out there, that is one of the few places where real investigative journalism has been happening. Um, and it's, it's tough because in cases like this, that's when you're not sure if you're getting hundred percent cooperation with law enforcement, that is a really good kind of secondary check when you get someone else that's digging into it. Uh, and unfortunately that type of journalism just is not quite as popular nowadays as it used to be. And it really takes someone taking that on, usually someone in a small newspaper, a small local newspaper that takes that on. And at least from what I'm seeing here, um, I don't see anyone really doing that. I see a lot of reports on television news, small local television news that are, you know, it sounds like they're just reading off a news feed and, and press releases. So back to the article, let's get some more details on what happened here. LaCornu was sitting in her car on March 2nd, 1996, just around the corner from her Towson home when someone killed her. She died from a, a single gunshot wound to the back. The motive and the killer remain a mystery. The sisters shared a bond that began in their mother's womb. They were twins born only two minutes apart. Hours before the homicide, police said LaCornu visited the Mount Washington Tavern. She left to buy beer at a liquor store on Falls Road. Neither police nor her family know why she stopped at what's now the Drumcastle Government Center parking lot. Quote, at some point when she was sitting in that parking lot, the suspect approached the car. We don't know how long he was there. We don't know what kind of interaction or if any interaction happened between the two. Baltimore County Police Corporal John Walker said. Now, from what I've heard, primarily from interviews from Jenny, there are at least four clips of videotape that are capturing the events here. Um, I have not seen anything from those videotapes. There are a couple of pictures that were released much, much later, like literally just in the past year. We're going to get to those. But I don't know about the quality of those videotapes. And from what this uh, corporal is saying here, um, it sounds like if they do have footage, it must be from really far away. I mean, he's not even sure about interaction that's going on uh, with the car. We do know that the car is found with the front window rolled down. So that would, and it was snowing out that night. So that would kind of lead you to believe that she was at least talking to this person before whatever happened happened. But uh, it's, it's a bit tough to know for sure. 
The suspect was described as a black man who is 5 feet 10 inches to 6 feet 1 inch tall and weighing 200 to 220 pounds. He was described as wearing a green fatigue style coat, at least according to this article. Uh, He would now be in his mid 40s to early 50s. He fired a single shot into the car, struck her in the back. After being shot, she managed to drive her car out of the parking lot across York Road. And this is a quote from Walker. So um, I, I'll be curious to get Jenny's point of view in terms of did she drive away and then the gunshot happened? Or is it more like what we're hearing um, from the police in this case? It was actually on my parents' wedding anniversary that she had been shot, Carreri said. After the vehicle stopped, the suspect who followed her over there approached the car, reached in, may have put it in park, but definitely took something out of that car, Wachter said. When he was finished, he got into a white BMW, exited the parking lot southbound on York Road, and turned left onto Walker Avenue. So um, police did get uh, some fingerprints lifted from the car that obviously were not Jody's. Um, they have run those prints. They're saying in this article that they are running those prints again. And this is an article just from last year. Um, obviously there has been no significant developments in terms of them double checking these prints in the database, which raises some questions for me. If we do consider that this might have been a drug deal gone bad, you have someone living a criminal lifestyle that probably most likely has not ever been charged with a crime, which I kind of struggle with a little bit, especially when you're looking at a period of time of 21 years, Um, because if they were charged with a crime, that means that their prints should be in the uh, NCIC database and they should be running these prints against those prints and hopefully finding a match they're not finding a match. So is it possible that this person that shot her was not part of any criminal element at all? Maybe someone that she knew personally, something along those lines. Um, I think that really has to be considered. Now jumping over to dclifeandstyle.com. And this one is written more in a blog format. So I'll just put that out there. I'm not sure how much I could really lean on the information that we get from this article, but uh, you can see the pictures they have here of the two sisters together at different points in their life. It's just extremely tragic. Uh, After the bar closed, the manager asked her to drive an employee home that could not drive. After dropping him off, she went to an ATM near the Caldor parking lot in Baltimore City. Once again, I don't know if I can trust that she went to an ATM. I think Jenny will help us clear that up. She picked up a six pack. From here, the timeline is vague. As she was sitting in the parking lot from the time the bar closed at 2 a.m. to this area around 340, she made a few phone calls. A gunman killed her while she was sitting in this parking lot through her rear passenger window and then apparently followed her in a BMW as she drove across the street to a giant parking lot and died. At this point, the man watched, followed her, and approached the car when it stopped, removed an item from the back seat, and left the scene. Workers called the police after hearing gunshots at 3.41 a.m. Yes, there are people that actually witnessed Uh, some of these events going on as well. It's really interesting to me that there are so many pieces where you have witnesses, you have video, um, but we're not able to bring this case home for some reason. Uh, She made several calls, one call back to the bar that she was at to reach the manager who was not available, as well as to a housemate's boyfriend. So from that, I'm getting that I think it's a former roommate of hers. Um, And she called, but she didn't talk to her actual roommate. She talked to her roommate's boyfriend. And I have seen some information that this person might be a drug dealer or might be connected to drug dealer elements. Uh, She spoke with him for two minutes. Two minutes is obviously more time than, hey, is Lisa there? No, she isn't. Okay, thanks. Tell her I called. Uh, Two minutes is a pretty considerable amount of time. Could she have been talking to him about potentially trying to find a hookup for drugs of some kind within two minutes? I think it's feasible. Um, And what's interesting there is 
he might have not given her a phone number to call to acquire these drugs. He might have said, yeah, I'll call this guy. I'll let him know. Why don't you wait in this part of town or in this particular parking lot and he will come and find you? Um, which means that when police were looking through the cell phone records, they would have no way to find the actual person that went to meet her. There would be this hoop of this guy in between, um, in between that, that linkage there. A white BMW was seen at the crime. One of Jody's acquaintances had a white Volvo. I believe this acquaintance they're talking about is that former roommate that she was trying to call. At 341 with the lighting, could the two be mistaken? Cops immediately ruled out this suspect due to the person not driving. And from what I heard from Jenny's interviews, that suspect is this boyfriend that could be connected to drug elements. And basically police ruled him out because they said, well, he doesn't drive. Yeah, but his girlfriend has a white Volvo. And here um, we have a photo of that type of Volvo and the type of BMW. Could you really get those cars mixed up? Um, especially if you have video and I'm not hundred percent sure that they have video of the BMW or at least very good video of it. Um, you know how shopping center cameras are. I mean, it could be extremely far away. Um, could you mistake those two cars, you know, maybe from the rear possibly, I think it's pretty tough from the front. I really wish we had our hands on that video that could really open this thing up in a whole different way. Did the police uh, rush to judgment? By the 4th of March, not even a full 48 hours after, they had released quotes to the press on the case, writing it off as random. I do think it's something we have to consider, the possibility that this was random. Um, was this guy just driving around in the middle of the night, saw that there was someone alone in a car there, happened to be a female, walk up to the side, knock on the window, uh, maybe said something to her. Do you want to hang out? Do you want to go somewhere? She told him to buzz off. Things got mean and all of a sudden there's a gunshot and she's dead. Um, but then what would he have taken out of her car? I really don't know. I don't know. I don't think we could totally write off that it was a random occurrence, uh, especially when we take a look at the way that the the gunfire happened and went through the seat. Um, there might be some things that actually support that theory, but at this point, unfortunately, it is just a theory. And here we have an article from people.com written in August of 2016, talking about the investigators renewing their efforts to try to solve this case. And their big push at this point is releasing photos that had never been released before. Um, and this is something I always struggle with on cases like this, guys. I know that there has to be a line between releasing information and trying to keep the integrity of your investigation and a possible uh, case against someone together. But quite honestly, even the photos they release here, I don't think that they could have really harmed uh, the prosecution of someone in this case. And these pictures are coming out over 20 years later. Um, I don't know. I just get frustrated by these things sometimes. This spring, the department renewed its effort to bring Joanne's killer to justice. They have released never before seen crime scene photos they hope will inspire someone who knows something to come forward. And ultimately, that's kind of what I'm hoping for, too. I think it's going to take someone to fill in this story a little bit. Uh, maybe someone that heard someone else talking or maybe someone that is a relative of this person that knew that they were missing that night. Uh, maybe someone that knows someone that was in this area that was potentially a drug dealer who would occasionally drive a white BMW. I'm not sure. But here we're looking at the gunshot. And what I'm curious of, uh, first of all, is was only one shot fired. Uh, we do have people that heard gunfire in the area. So did they literally just hear one shot? Did they hear multiple shots? Uh, from what I can see in this footage, it looks like there is only one bullet hole. Uh, from all the descriptions I've heard, it was only one bullet that hit her. Uh, you have to imagine that the trajectory of this, if it wound up, I believe I heard that it severed her spine. So the, tra the trajectory of this shot uh, is very interesting to me. Unless she was leaning over the center console or something, the, the, the gunfire had to be coming almost from the very rear of the window, 
obviously shattered the window as it came through, uh, hit here, or maybe he was holding it and facing it downward if he was holding the gun a little bit higher. But still, this window was intact when the gunfire happened. Um, it's just, it's a heck of a shot. And what I'm struggling with when I look at this picture is I'm wondering if he was actually intending to kill her or if he was trying to scare her, scare her by shooting out her back window and things uh, went wrong for some reason. Um, it just, it doesn't seem like a good shot to me. Quite honestly, from his point of view, he's popping around into the back of a seat. He can't judge from that. You can't see through that seat. You don't know where it's going to hit her in terms of her body uh, and where it hits her uh, in the spine. I'm not sure how low down her back that is, but is that always going to be a critical injury? I just, I don't know that the intent of this person was to kill her if it is one shot through a chair, which by the way, could have metal pieces in it that could deflect parts of that or all of that shot entirely. It just doesn't seem like a good way to shoot someone to me. Um, I really, I really struggle with trying to understand the intent of this shot, the way that it came in. If he wanted to kill her, it would have made a lot more sense for him to be standing at the side window and to put the gun to her head. That's clearly not what happened here. And maybe we'll get clarification from Jenny that this is part of the theory why the car was driving off and he took a shot in it while it was moving or something. That kind of makes more sense to me after looking at, at this picture. One of the scenarios they were floating with for a while was that she was buying drugs, but there were no drugs in her system. I don't think that necessarily rules out that theory. Uh, it could be that this was the initial contact for her to get some drugs. Uh, maybe not the first time she met this dealer. Maybe she had known this dealer for a while. Uh, I do think that they should look into avenues of could she have possibly owed someone money or something along those lines. Uh, LaCornu had completed a cocaine treatment program as a teen, Carreri admits, but as an adult, her twin sister was fully committed to living a sober life, Carreri says. I struggle with that phrasing of that comment just a little bit because, uh, and I've seen Jenny talk about this in other places, she admits that her sister had a problem with alcohol. And I think most treatment programs that you go to are going to warn you about alcohol as potentially being a slippery slope to getting back to whatever drug you're trying to get yourself off of. It impairs your, your judgment. It impairs your ability to make good decisions. And that could all of a sudden get you, you know, calling people, calling around, trying to score your old favorite narcotic, particularly if you're in a stressful situation, like potentially ending a five-year relationship or even just having a real nasty fight with your boyfriend and not being able to go home. Another theory suggests LaCornu's death resulted from an attempted robbery gone bad. I think we've covered that uh, pretty well here. I'm, I'm very curious to understand more about what was found in the car. The police claim she was told by her boyfriend not to come home, and so that's why she was sitting in her car when she was shot, Carreri explains. She was killed on my parents' wedding anniversary. My sister's death was always hard on my father, who passed away without ever knowing the truth about her murder. He did die, unfortunately, from cancer several years ago. Um, it was also worth noting that he was a prosecutor, I believe, for the state and worked on cases having to do with violent crime and drugs. Uh, so one theory that I've been seeing that's kind of kicking around is, could this have potentially been a hit based on some work that her father had done at some point? Um, I struggle with it a little bit because of her movements on this night. We have her, admittedly, she goes to a bar where she's known to hang out. So perhaps someone could have followed her from there. But her movements after that seem kind of randomized. She's taken someone home, potentially going to an ATM. We know she certainly went somewhere and bought a six pack. Who knows why she picked this particular parking lot? It might have just looked like a quiet place for her to sit and hang out and maybe sleep in her car for the night. Um, it's just very unfortunate that... Uh, that this situation came up. Quite honestly, I'd feel horrible if I was her boyfriend. If that story is right and he told her not to come home, um, that just, it seems extremely short-sighted to put someone at risk because you're having an argument with them. You know, 
go, go to a hotel, you know, or tell them to go to a hotel or arrange for them to go to a hotel, but uh, just telling them not to come home. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know it's, it's tough when people get emotional and relationships can make us act in very bizarre ways. But I got to tell you guys, I'd be, I'd be carrying a lot of this on my back if I had been the one that told her not to come home. Uh, Detective Carol, I believe it's Bollinger, might be Bollinger, uh, a 30-year police veteran who joined the cold case unit more than 10 years ago and has been the lead on the Lacorno case, tells people he thinks someone holds the key to solving this decades-old mystery. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of an obvious statement, um, but I, I fully believe that's true. Bollinger tells people investigators have re-entered the fingerprints they recovered from Lacorno's car into the nation's criminal database. Hopeful they'll get a hit after all these years. Uh, he has also been conducting fresh interviews with several persons of interest who've been connected to the case. He's also talking to Lacorno's friends and ex-boyfriends again. We're also trying to develop DNA off of some of the items we've collected from the scene where previously we couldn't. We are going over video taken at the time using new technologies. Our video examiners are now able to take apart a video and ret retract an image from it where you couldn't do that 20 years ago. We're just going back to see if we can shake the tree and get any apples to fall. I'm happy to hear these comments because the other comments that I read about them not being able to do anything with the video, uh, not being able to enhance it, I, I just know that that's false. The question is, can you enhance it to a point where it could provide something helpful to you, like being able to make out a license plate or something like that? But any video can be enhanced. Literally, this that I'm recording right now can be enhanced. Uh, the, the tools are easily and readily available. Um, but like I said, it, there is a big stretch between enhancing an image and actually getting to the point where it can provide you with new information. And now we hit a development that is unfortunate, and I see it time and time again, particularly in missing persons cases, um, but of course it's going to apply to homicides as well. Uh, there is inevitably, especially in unsolved cases, a point where the family becomes frustrated with the investigators. And you're looking at a case here that is over 21 years old, um, and this is this is no different. Jenny got frustrated with how the investigators uh, were speaking to her, treating the case, uh, and she decided to hire an attorney, decided to try to get access to the records, uh, the, to the police files. How did all that go? Well, let's take a look at this article from WYPR.org. Jenny Carreri is frustrated that Baltimore County police appear to be no closer to solving her twin sister murder now than they were on an early snowy morning in 1996. She charges that detectives have mishandled the case. Quote, they were not following up on leads, lying, contradicting themselves. It's just been, it's incredible what we've gone through, she says. Carreri wants to put the case in front of a fresh set of eyes. She requested the case file through the Maryland Public Information Act, MPIA, last August. Two weeks later, police rejected the request on the grounds that it would interfere with an open case. I have to say, unfortunately, I am not surprised. Uh, for some reason, in the majority of cases that I look into, Information Act requests um, don't come through. And having the case still be open is not the only excuse I've seen. Um, there are a lot of reasons why individual jurisdictions will make these excuses about why they can't release the information. And sometimes you have to force it by potentially pushing towards a court case and threatening to sue the department. Crary says her sister was not acting as her normal self at the time. She had a lot of anxiety and she would not have driven in the snow, Crary said. She was asked to drive an employee home. She never would have done that. She never would have gone to sit in a parking lot by herself. Well, it's interesting because we know that she did these things. So at that point, we have to figure uh, what is her intent? Obviously, her intent is different on this day than it is normally for what her sister would expect her to be doing. Is it possible... Um, you know, if we dry, if we go down the thought that she was trying to score drugs, that would certainly alter her intent. 
that might get her to drive in the snow. That might get her to potentially take this employee home. This employee maybe had a roommate that might have had some connections. Maybe he went to check with someone. Uh, maybe he was offering to help her with her quest in some way. I'm not sure. Um, and then getting back to this point of her sitting in the parking lot by herself, obviously, if her live-in boyfriend said, uh, you know, don't come home, I'm not going to let you in. Uh, maybe that's what led her to that. It's just really unfortunate she didn't think of, you know what, I've got friends that I could go to, or I should call my sister, or I should just at least get myself into a hotel. Quite honestly, even if you, even if you are going to try to drink your problems away, get yourself into a safe situation. Sitting in a parking lot in the middle of the night, it's just, it's so risky. Um, and I think that's why her sister is so frustrated by these activities. They just, they don't sound safe. And from everything I, from everything that I've reviewed, it seems like her sister was kind of a nervous person and didn't really trust the Baltimore area a whole lot. And she would even ask employees at her bank to watch her as she walked out to her car to make sure she got to her car okay. Carreri thinks that her twin sister knew the gunman. Her window was rolled down, which makes one believe that she knew the person because she wouldn't have rolled her window down just to talk to somebody in the middle of the night. I think that's a pretty decent conclusion. County police spokeswoman Elise Armacost says the Locorno case is open and was active as recently as January. She said detectives traveled to California to pursue leads. Wonder what that could be about, but unfortunately there is no more detail on it. And Jenny had to ultimately push it all the way. We see this article at baltimoresun.com. Woman sues Baltimore County police for access to files in sister's unsolved killing. The lawsuit filed in October seeks for a judge to order the police to allow Carreri access to the records. A spokesman for the department said the agency does not comment on pending litigation. Carreri said she filed the lawsuit because she believes the records contain information that could help find her sister's killer. I feel that the case can be solved. I really do, she said. And this kind of raises a little bit of an interesting point with me. Um, we know that police departments are only solving somewhere around 60, maybe up to 65% of their homicides, which means you've got around 35, possibly as high as 40% that aren't being solved. Now, is it possible that you have information in a police case file that would be enough information to at least let the family know we heavily suspect it's this person, even if they don't have enough information to prosecute that person. What I'm saying is of that 35 to 40% that they don't get to close, is there enough of an answer in some of those files just for the family to hear and to know what happened to their loved one? I believe there is. And I think it is really a shame that we get into these situations where you have police holding on to information for decades saying that this case is open. It's questionable if they're really acting on it uh, all the time. Uh, isn't there, I just, I keep thinking that there should be some type of trigger where if you guys don't solve it in 15 years, it's automatic. That case file gets opened or gets shared with some, maybe another department to re-review the case. There's got to be some mechanism to push these things forward not everyone can afford to hire a lawyer and to try to sue their way into that file like Jenny is doing here. So ultimately, what came out of this? Um, there, I saw that there was a court date scheduled for March 2017. I asked Jenny about it today. She can't really comment except to say that some type of agreement happened between her and the police department and she has retracted the case. For me to see all the work that she has done in terms of raising exposure and trying to solve this case, I would have to believe that that agreement gave her something pretty substantial, maybe some type of promise of further activities that are going to go on with, with police, something along those lines. There's some, there's some reason why she would have stepped off the accelerator at that point. And before this whole lawsuit, the only access they were talking about was that they would allow her legal team to potentially come into the police station and sit with the case file and read through it. Of course, um, I'm sure the case file is probably hundreds, if not thousands of pages. 
Um, it, I'm sure that would have cost an arm and a leg. Most lawyers get charged by the hour. Uh, and even outside of that, could the lawyer really retain all the pertinent information and be able to relay that back to Jenny in a way that made any kind of sense? Could be highly doubtful. I've looked through police files. Um, it can be very tough to find the pertinent information that you're looking at. There's a lot of, you know, they're, they're cataloging a lot of information and not all of it is exactly um, related to the the points that you're either trying to prove or disprove. So. I understand what a challenge that was. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to ask her about the lawsuit or that agreement. So just know if you drop those types of questions in the comments below, I'm really not going to be able to do anything about it. But this is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Please um, dig into this case. I have many more links in the description box below than we've actually covered today. Uh, and if you find other information outside of that, please share it with the rest of us in the comments below. Send me those questions that you have for Jenny about this particular case. Um, and let's see if we can help her maybe think of some angles to look in or some different directions to take to help her keep moving forward on this. Uh, it is really a shame uh, their mother is still alive, and uh, I don't think that she has um, handled this very well. I mean, she she lost a daughter, and now she has another daughter that has been, you know, spending 21 years trying to bring justice to this. It it can't be easy on this family, and if there's something we can do to help, I really hope that you guys will help me do that. Uh, speaking of which, one way that we can help. Uh, is there is a GoFundMe page. This was actually built back in October of 2016 by Jenny herself. And um, let me first say before I get into this, she did not mention this at all. I found this on my own through researching this case. Um, this is not anything like the situation that we had last week. Uh, I don't even want to mention uh, the, the case again. Um, but just know this GoFundMe was started particularly by Jenny because she has hired a private investigator. I'm looking forward to asking her about that experience. Uh, did they potentially find any other information that we haven't seen reported here? Uh, and it also mentions that she was going to try to sue the county to get access to Jody's case. But um, I'm sure, I mean, she's only raised just over $2,000 here, and I'm sure that the private investigator costs have already exceeded that. Uh, as you can see here, once again, a very big thank you to my wonderful Patreon supporters. We have already made a donation here, uh, and I hope that that goes directly to any uh, investigation fees or uh, payments that Jenny might have to make on this case. And hopefully we can see something happen with this case in terms of it coming to a conclusion something that can help Jenny move forward, help their mother understand a bit more of what happened and move forward. Um, I don't know. It's a real heartbreaker of a case, guys. So if there's something you can do to help me with it, it's by thinking, getting us theories and questions in that comment box below. I will be going through all those and uh, having a nice long conversation with Jenny next week. And you will see it here on Brain Scratch next Friday. Um, I'm actually interviewing her on Wednesday. So you have several days to get your questions and comments down below uh, in consideration for the interview with Jenny. And I really appreciate you guys doing that. Let's show her this amazing community of people that care about others and see if we can help her find some new leads to chase down. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I really appreciate you guys out there. I hope you stay safe, have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on the Lord and Arch channel on Monday. Take care.